And one of the things we did in our experiment is that I did not want to create hourly employees by paying flight instructors per hour instruction. And I didn't want to get into a discussion about is the instruction they get in the air worth more per hour to the school, that is we bill more to the customer because they're flying versus ground. All of our CFIs are on salary. All of our CFIs get health benefits free to them and then is offered at some rate to their families. That means to us, every CFI that we bring on is a $62,000 a year employee. And it's worked great. It's worked great because when you do programs that require scenario-based training and require proficiency-based training, there's a lot more ground to be done. Now, I am never going to replace flying as a motivation for people who love to fly. But by putting them on salary, it's worked out very well for us, and they continue to meet our expectations. Jerry talked a little bit about how the customer was charged, and it never was the cost of training. We talked about that in the CPC program for about 10 years, and inevitably the discussion gets down to, well, how are we going to build the instructor? Successful people, type A, AAA, AA personalities don't care what the price is, as Jerry said. What they care is that there is a broken promise and an overrun at the end. And it is those snake oily type people, and maybe I'm inventing a word here, but we come from a state that has a lot of both. It is that snake oily kind of flight school that tries to induce somebody in and then jacks up to 30 or 40 or 50 percent or sometimes 200 percent cost overruns as their real cost of training for the certificate. That's what irritates the buyer. <clears throat> the other part about this is, if you think about the learning cycle of someone who is successful, they believe that they can come in here and do this all at once. They've been successful in everything else they've done in their life. Why can't I get this? Well, it's going to take some time before you develop these, these motor skills. And they are frustrated if they're paying by the hour because every time they pay by the hour, they don't feel $300 smarter. They start to wonder whether this is for them. And boy, the way, that Harley's looking pretty good right now. And it's coming into the fall season, and all those boat guys who didn't sell their summer boats, man, I can probably get a pretty good deal on those as well. And that doesn't take any training whatsoever. Just look at the motorcycle accident rate. So our findings were that fixed pricing works well with a caveat. You need screening programs. We've had people come in for our, our instrument training programs and quickly found out after we offered them a guaranteed price, and by the way, all our prices are guaranteed, that they couldn't <laughs> um, fly. They couldn't take off, they couldn't land, they couldn't turn, they couldn't climb, and they couldn't descend. Now, how they got through the system, we all know how that works in the flight training industry, but we can't spend seven or eight sorties in a 172 just trying to get somebody where they can land safely to meet one PTS parameter of landing from an instrument approach. We had the same problem with some of our commercial customers who could neither fly nor could they fly instruments. So as a way to do that, we offer a free, free, by, mind you, flight review before you ever start your instrument training program. And we offer a free flight review and a free instrument proficiency check before you ever start the commercial program. And why is it free? Because it's a lot easier for me to find out from the get-go whether this person even has the aptitude to do the training and will they be able to do it in the time frame that we've committed to do it with. The DFC-90 all-digital attitude-based autopilot delivers significant performance and safety improvements over previous generation systems. Its innovative flight envelope protection guards against autopilot-induced stalls, and the straight and level mode provides one-button recovery from unusual attitudes for an added measure of safety. Immensely popular within the Cirrus community, the DFC-90 is now being made available for a growing list of aircraft including Piper Matrix and Mirage, Cessna 182s, and Beach Bonanzas and Barons. Fly with confidence. Fly with DFC-90. We might get some interesting questions tomorrow about 141 special curricula, which is what we run here. And I'm not going to get into that today because it becomes rather detailed. But I believed and still do that being 141 accredited allows the uninformed consumer at least something that they can hang their hat on in terms of what they're signing up for. And that is, is this organization credible? And by the way, this would allow us to do our training as we wanted to do it, more on a proficiency basis than, than rather on a straight time basis. We also have a FITS accepted curricula, and that'll save for that time as well. Our findings were that it worked extremely well. Now, by the way, we happen to have a very good FISDO, and I happen to have, and I, I hope he's not in the room because I wouldn't want him to hear this, I have an excellent primary operations inspector. 
and I have an excellent primary maintenance inspector, except he's not the guy you know, who actually does my maintenance. I'm assigned to somebody else, but I have an excellent one who comes here all the time to help us on maintenance issues. So we've been very well supported by the FAA in that regard. My thought, naively, was that if we do all this right, we'd have a 100% retention rate, and we wouldn't lose anyone in the training. And the findings were, this was a completely ludicrous assumption. Not only will we lose people, there are people that we actively want to lose. Let me give you an example. We've had people come in for an instrument training rec uh, program, as I talked about, that could not fly. And as a matter of fact, as a designated examiner, I can tell you they, they, they would never pass a 709 ride because they are not qualified to hold a private pilot certificate. Where they got it, how they got it, where they trained, I have no idea, but I can tell you the end result is we're not going to train them. We have people who come in here with unresolved medical problems that aren't reported to the FAA. And while I sympathize for people who are getting older in years, and, and all of us, all of us are a, you know, hey, what's that? away from not having a medical certificate, you can't come in and expect to be in a commercial training operation when you have, for example, uncontrolled diabetes. So there are people that we've had just have, had to have frank discussion with and said, you know, in a very nice way, this training program is not for you, as a way of saying neither is any other. And you will, of course, get people who come in the school who are disruptive to the training process and disruptive to the staff. And when I say disruptive, I mean abusive and that can't be tolerated. And I've had to have a discussion or two with some folks. And there was then, our, we get to our third person who I had to invite to train elsewhere. There is also a problem in that there are some people who are so OCD, they cannot accept being on a proficiency-based training schedule. Because in order to do proficiency-based training, which is a wonderful way to train, by the way, they, they have to allow that every single day, and by the way, even in the airplane, every single flight or every single simulator session, the instructor is changing the events that happen based on that person's demonstrated proficiency. So if we have an hour in the sim and the objective is to work on ILS approaches and after the third one, this person has got that nailed, we are certainly not going to discontinue the sim. We are going to use that time to move on to something else. This is very disruptive to somebody who really has an obsessive case of of control. And there has been one person who's come to the school that wanted a schedule from the day they started every single hour until the day that they finished. That is just not possible. And we, we certainly shook hands and, and, and parted ways, but it wouldn't work. Welcome to the Aero News Network, the aviation world's most comprehensive news and information resource. Real-time, 24-7 online, audio, and video programming, where aviation has been getting updated for over a decade. Distributing over 11,000 stories, features, audio, and video programs every year, only ANN covers aviation and aerospace with this much depth, insight, and expertise. Check us out on the web at aero-news.net. We also made an assumption that we weren't going to do any knowledge test preparation. We don't have time to do that in a three-week course. We thought it would act as a filtering mechanism, that is, if they've already taken the written test, if they have survived the process of memorizing 600 questions, then they probably have the motivation to begin training. And the fact is, it's worked pretty well. With the exception is, it did not prepare them in any way for the oral portion of the practical test. And I'm going to talk about that just a little bit later on. John touched on this, you know, the FAA has a very, very good effort, started with an ARC and now an AROC, to change the way that knowledge testing is done. Because we understand that the current rote response methodology just forces people to memorize thousands of facts without any real understanding of what those facts are. And by the way, it's very hard for those people, if they've just taken that course, to shed all that irrelevant knowledge. People have limited computer capability inside their head, and their storage is now with useless information, and doing the RAM dump to pack it up with all the stuff they need to know is sometimes challenging. 